Good morning, my name is Katie Yates and I am a public relations specialist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Welcome to our monthly coffee chat series where I meet with different staff from our department to chat about recreation, management and conservation over some coffee. Today, I am so excited to be catching up with Landowner Relations Corporal Dave Shabbat and we're gonna be talking about Maine's unique landscape, recreating on private land and how to be safe and prepared when heading out this spring. For those of you watching at home, you can join the conversation at any time by typing in your questions and comments in the chat box, and we will answer questions as time allows and towards the end of our conversation. Just as a reminder, this video is recorded and will be available for watching later on our YouTube channel. So Dave, I'm excited to have some coffee with you this morning. How are you? There we go. All right. <laughs> well, uh, I'm doing great, Katie. How are you? It's nice to see you, you know via computer at least. So it'd be nice when we all can get back to the office. Yes, I'm really looking forward to that. Although I have to say when it's cold, I really don't mind <laughs> <laughs> hiding in my, in my home office. Uh -huh. So Landowner Relations Corporal is a, a really unique position within our agency. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your background and what you do for the department. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Kate. Um, Again, Katie was explaining, a landowner relations corporal, so that the position sits within the uh, Bureau of the Warden Service. Um, just two of us, uh, my counterpart is uh, Corporal Rick LaFlem. Um, the program in general is uh, essentially to take care of Maine's private landowners, right? Um, it's been around for approximately, I don't know, 20, 27 years, somewhere around there. Um, it switched back and forth. Uh, from our department to Department of Conservation or DACF, um, sat on a shelf for a little bit, now it's come back. Um, it's really neat to have a program that is uh, just dedicated to Maine's landowners, right? And my, my job and Rick's job is to, uh, if they have an issue, we want to know about them, we want to be able to help them and solve it. So um, it, it, it's one of those programs that I'm, I'm proud to be a part of, something that as a district game warden here in Androscoggin County, um, it was something I believed in um, all those years. You know, I'm in my 24 and a half years in here, um, almost up to my 25 year anniversary. And uh, I took this position about three years ago um, just because of my strong belief. Not only am I uh, been a game warden in this area with my farmers and my private landowners, but I'm also a landowner. And uh, so I, I, I hold those same strong beliefs that many landowners have. And this is just a way that I could take from my little community that I was serving to uh, providing a statewide service. So I was fortunate enough that this second position was uh, created. Um, I give kudos to the department, to the legislature and uh, um, the Bureau of Warden Service to create the second position because of the importance that landowners do provide the citizens of the state and the, the state as a whole. So. And you're a land user too. I mean, you recreate in Maine. Oh, I, yeah, I've recreated all the way from, you know, Aroosa County to York County. So um, whether that be snowmobiling, ATVing, you know, um, hunting, fishing. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been an important part of my life, right? I grew up here. So um, it's one of those things I've never taken for granted. It's uh, very much important to me. And um, that's why I do this job, hopefully to be able to give back as well. So let's talk a little bit about getting out this spring. I know the weather has been pretty good. Yesterday maybe is not a good example of that. Yeah. <laughs> and I know lots of people are probably ready to hit the ATV trails. Uh, what are some things for them to keep in mind? Well, first and foremost, right? It's, you know, our springtime is mud season. I mean, you look at the weather, you know, I mean, we never know when we're going to get a couple inches of rain that is going to, uh, you know, disturb that soil that's not packed yet, that's not set up for use. Um, never know when we're going to get that snowstorm. So again, this, this comes down to Maine's private landowners, you know, where 94% of Maine is privately owned uh, by their good gracious, they, they allow us onto their property. So we, we need to respect that. Our clubs uh, do some tremendous work. Every year they have to make contact with the landowners, make sure nothing has changed, reach out, try to maintain the trails. Um, 
the ATV industry is, is, is booming. Um, we saw it last year. I mean, you couldn't go buy an ATV anywhere. Um, it's one of the things we just have to be conscious. If we're not on our own property, that means we're on somebody else's property. Um, treat it better than you would ever treat any of your stuff. I mean, that, that's really where we need to be. We need to hold that and not take it for granted. Um, somebody owns where you are. Tread lightly, respect it. Don't go on the trails until uh, till they're open, till the club authorizes it. And, you know, don't take your Jeep, your truck. You know, I mean, it's one of those things, even on people get up north right now, right? They want to go do some spring fishing. Well, those roads are owned by our private landowners, our paper companies, their industrial forests. That doesn't mean they're our roads. They own them. Let's respect that. Let's not go and dig up their roads, right? That's a lot of maintenance. It's a lot of uh, grading. That's, that's dirt. That's, we need to be respectful. Like I said, if we're not on our property, we're on somebody else's. You know, we only have very, uh, very little uh, public lands, right? between IFNW, Department of Conservation, or DACF, and uh, federal lands. I mean, there's, that only equates to about 1.6 million. So it's not a lot out of 21 million acres. Where can someone get more information about the conditions of the trails or to stay kind of connected to that that type of information so that they are complying with best practices? Oh, hands down, you know what? Um, depending on the area you ride, if you ride in several different areas, become a member of that local club, right? They're doing you a favor. Um, unfortunately, um, there's only usually a handful of people that stuff up to maintain it, but uh, money does go a long ways as well. And uh, stuff up, contribute in that way. Uh, join the local club that you're recreating in. It provides for the very trails that you're, uh, that you're uh, riding on. Um, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, the ATV division under uh, Brian Bronson, who's the director for that. Um, they have a website that updates. So again, we're trying to improve that communication. If in doubt, call, right? They can reach out to uh, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. They can uh, utilize social media. A lot of that stuff is readily accessible now. Great, thank you. And it's not just recreational vehicles that are out. I've seen lots of anglers and boaters out on the water or, you know, alongside the road fishing. And I know people are excited about the warm weather, but I think the water is still pretty cold right now. You know, the water is extremely cold. It's something that, uh, you know, being a lifelong Mainer and a fisherman as well, um, we take for granted that life jacket, right? Uh, I became a firm believer in, in, in life jackets here when I became, you know, game warden. And uh, I've yet to um, see somebody regret uh, not wearing their life jacket, right? Um, we've got the life jacket that, uh, you know what, don't take for granted that you're out there with a bunch of people and, oh, I'll be fine. Well, the, Various things can happen when you're outdoors. Mother Nature is not very kind. <laughs> so you need to be prepared, um, especially if you're alone. If you're alone, you know what? Use every safety precaution you have. Um, I mean, wear your life jacket. Attach your uh, cutoff switch to you. You know, um, if you're in a canoe, please, by all means, wear your life jacket. Um, if you're in your little boat, if you're in your big boat, right? I mean, I have a fairly... A uh, large size boat. Um, when I'm by myself, I, I got it on. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, do I wear it when I have other people involved? Eh, sometimes, but guess what? They're readily accessible. All right, readily accessible doesn't mean that the life jackets are stuffed in the uh, compartment in the front hall of your. No, they're right there. They're readily accessible to you. They're not under a seat. They're not buckled to a seat. They're not hidden. They're readily accessible. All right, so by all means, wear your life jacket, um, use your engine cutoff switch, your tether cord. Um, those are all things that can, uh, you know, take that thing where you don't think it's gonna happen to you. Every person we've dealt with where there's been a tragic incident, um, I've heard from family members or the person involved, I didn't think it would happen. I, I didn't expect that. It happened so fast. So 
that right there is just testament that you need to always be prepared, especially on Maine's water. I mean, if you don't know how to swim, you know what? Go take a swimming lesson. We have so much water in the state of Maine. Um, don't take that for granted. Take a swimming lesson. It's a great skill to have. But even if you know how to swim, if you hit that cold water, it'd oh, it's cold. We've uh, we've done the training. You know, and I've been fortunate, right? We, we're we're highly trained. Um, the department uh, makes us jump in the water. You know, with our full gear on and all that stuff. It is quite a shot. Um, if you've never done it, it's one of those things that instant panic does set in. You know, um, it's just be prepared. You know, I don't suggest go and uh, do it yourself, but just know that. You're gonna be okay. Keep a cool head and uh, do your best. And uh, if you have your life jacket, you're gonna you're gonna be just fine. So have a whistle attached to your life jacket as well, right? Sound producing device. It covers you for the boat, but it also uh, if it's attached to your life jacket, you're good to go. If somebody does find themselves in a position where they're getting into some trouble, I think a whistle is an amazing piece of advice, but what, what is something, what are some next steps for them if they're in a situation where maybe they, whether they're out hiking or they're, they find yeah, you know, um, we always carry three pieces of equipment, right? A knife, a compass, and uh, some matches or a fire starter, right? So those are the three things that any game warden out in the field, that's what they're going to have on them. All right. With those, with those three tools, that's the bare minimum. With those three tools, you're going to be able to you know, start a fire. What's a fire? Caveman TV has this wonderful way of uh, kind of just uh, relaxing you, you know, um, provides warmth, provides comfort, um, and it allows you to kind of just get your head around you and you can spend the night. It's, it's all right. The woods are the, at night are the same as they are during the day. Nothing out there is going to hurt. So just be prepared. Wear the right clothing, right? Layers. You know, don't go hiking the Appalachian Trail in flip-flops or Birkenstocks or even sneakers. That's how you get in trouble. You've got to be prepared for the conditions because, again, you're not going to be given any leeway. It, it, whatever's coming at you, it's coming at you, and you need to be prepared for that. Great. Thank you. And I also know that turkey season is coming up in a few yes. year opener is May 3rd. Any advice for turkey hunters when it comes to uh, recreating in Maine? Yeah, well, first and foremost, right? Um, I, I don't think you're gonna um, ever have uh, a hard time getting permission from any Maine's landowners regarding, uh, regarding hunting turkeys. Um, you know, it, it's funny, I've got to see uh, the turkey uh, when it first started getting introduced. Matter of fact, uh, the first turkey uh, that I ever uh, harvested, um, we used to have to put in for a permit, like a, like a lottery system that you had to do for uh, moose. And uh, really, really neat. Back then, people protected them. If somebody harassed a turkey or anything, uh, they would be calling us up and letting us know uh, the illegal harvest. Over the years, they've kind of been villainized and all that. Um, Everybody out there just needs to know that, believe it or not, Maine probably has one of the best turkey hunting experiences in the United States. We're, we're ranked as one of the top 10 states to go and harvest a uh, turkey. Um, very unique. It's actually a very uh, a great success story. Uh, we don't have a lot of them. That was one of them. And um, I'm proud that my department did that. Um, it's awesome to be able to participate in that hunt. Uh, like my wife says, right, the first time we, I ever took her out, and I've had a lot of people say this, it's like watching, uh, you know, watching the day wake up. It, it's a great experience if you, if you don't find somebody to take you out and to watch the world wake up in the morning like that, it's great. Um, again, ask for permission, all right? Um, majority of the landowners, even if their land is posted, the reason being is they just want to know who's recreating on their property. They want to maintain control of what they, what their investment is. It's not that they don't want you on it. They just want to know who you are. That, that comes with a simple introduction. Hey, I'd like to, uh, you know, turkey hunt, deer hunt on your property. Ask, make that conversation. Um, again, make it clear what permission you're asking for, right? The permission, if it's granted to you, it's for you. It's not for you and six of your buddies 
If you're going to have somebody else with you, tell the landowner, thank you very much. I usually hunt with, you know, a friend. I usually hunt in, in communicate. That's where uh, people get into trouble sometimes. They don't properly communicate um, or they're, I don't want to say being devious or, you know, giving this information. They're just not fully um, explaining, you know, expectations have to be met on both sides. So again, communication, introduction, um, sharing, right? Hey, I got a turkey today. Do you want, do you want the breast? Do you want the turkey meat? You know, share it. Uh, they might not have ever had it. And uh, it's one of those things, just don't take it for granted. Go out, enjoy yourself. But again, if you're not on your property, you're on somebody else's and uh, ask for us. We, that's, you know, we take for granted that, oh, it's not posted property. We can go on it. Yes, that's a, that, that free access, that open access tradition that we have here in Maine, that can be gone in an instant. And we need to, we need to realize that, that uh, um, we're very fortunate for what we have here. Um, doing this job, I've met a lot of people that have actually uh, come to Maine and um, they're doing their doctorates or their, their thesis, all this different uh, types of college papers. And because of what Maine, New Hampshire and New England kind of offers on that, that open access. So it's really, really neat on how, how unique that is to the state. And those of you out there that uh, have never hunted in another state, try it. You, uh, you'll be uh, very surprised that you can't just go where you want, like you can here at home. So be respectful, be thankful. I know that we had someone ask permission to hunt hares this past winter on our land. And it was actually great because he would send me text messages when he would go out and let me know what he saw. So I saw turkey tracks or I saw this type of, of scat or sign. And it was great for me because I got to kind of get a sense of what he was seeing in our land when I maybe wasn't able to go out. So I can really build some really great relationships in your community. Oh, absolutely, Katie. You know, and if he was using, say he was using uh, trail cameras, right? You need to get permission to use a trail camera on somebody else's property. Well, guess what's really cool? Share those pictures, right? Um, I, met, I met with a uh, gentleman um, down towards Deer Isle and uh, he opened his land up to a person and he never allowed trail cameras before. Well, this time, this one guy, he really hitched horses with him. Um, he let them put out trail cameras and they were seeing these massive bucks that he had no idea lived on his property. What would, because of those cameras, guess what the uh, hunter did? He actually set the guy up in a spot and he actually harvested the largest deer he ever harvested and it happened to come off his own property. So it was, it was a great experience between those two. Um, it sounds like they've, uh, made a lifelong friendship and they're actually hunting buddies. So it was really, really neat. And that just happened, you know, just because he stopped and asked and communicated what he wanted to do. So it, it was pretty neat to hear that story. And real quick, Dave, I think it might be important. We're talking about turkey hunting and just getting out in general. Tick safety is just good advice. It has nothing to do with landowner relations. It's just right. good, just a good reminder. It, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm glad you bring that up because that kind of hits, hits home, right? Um, I've, I've had, uh, Lyme disease and have suffered from some long-term uh, stuff with it. Um, that, that's serious stuff. Don't handle that tick, all right? Get a tick spoon. They have all these little things. It's worth the, the dollar at Walmart to get that tick spoon, all right? You not only utilize it for yourself, but you utilize it for your animals. Um, again, uh, they're pretty bad this year, um, just like last year uh, because of the... Uh, the snow insulation, the ticks are out in force. Um, check yourself and use permethrin when you can, right? On your clothing, don't put that on your skin. Um, but always, always, always check yourself. If you do have an embedded tick, by all means, do not handle it with your fingers. Don't try to just pull it off. Utilize a tick spoon if you don't feel comfortable with it. Go to emergency care and get it taken care of. Um, if it is embedded, make sure you contact your doctor get your antibiotics. Um, it's, it's something not to take lightly. Uh, we're not used to it here in Maine. You know, they showed up probably, I can remember my first tick about 20, 22 years ago that I had on me. Um, 
yeah, it's one of those things that uh, don't don't take it lightly. You, you, it, those things uh, they got some bad stuff in them, and um, it's serious. It, it can make you can make you extremely ill, if not uh, on on some cases could be deadly. So um, that's very very rare. But I tell you, you don't want what they have because you do get sick. Yeah, just always check yourself and treat your clothes. Check yourself you and. Whatever you do, do not handle that tick. The minute you start trying to pull it off, you're making it spit in you and it's, it's giving you all the gunk and you, you don't want it. You don't, trust me, you don't want it. That's great advice. Thank you, Dave. Well, I do see lots of chatter right now in the comments. Awesome. And a lot of it is about, you know, some of them are landowners who are thinking about posting their land. Uh, some of them are landowners who have posted their land, and then some of them are land users who are not sure how to get access to posted land or even mm -hmm. to ask permission regardless of the activity. So I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into that. And I know everyone's experience with the outdoors looks totally different, but we're all sharing this landscape, whether you're a birder or a hiker or dog walker or a hunter and, or even the landowner, and you might be recreating on private land, more than likely you are. Um, and it makes me special, as you've stated, but we've seen an increase in participation in the last year. And so what does this mean for Maine's landowners and what are some options for them? Well, uh, Rick and I's job has probably uh, doubled, tripled, quadrupled uh, just with uh, outreach from Maine's landowners saying, hey, I, I've got this issue. I've, uh, I've got a tremendous amount of people hiking on my property. They're telling me they're finding my property on Maine Trail Finder. This isn't this isn't a open, you know, trail. This is like a little secret spot that, you know, the locals use and I don't mind that, but look at all the people coming here, the roads filled. We gotta be cognizant of that. We gotta, we gotta recognize that, okay, this, if it's not a, um, a generalized thing, you, you see it on Facebook. Oh, come look at Maine's waterfalls. Well, those waterfalls are on somebody's property, right? Those aren't state of Maine lands. So we really just got to uh, realize where we're at, what we're doing, um, in, in the burden that's being placed on to our landowners right now. Um, we're all looking to get outdoors, but again, it's great. But you just have to realize that, uh, you know what, if you get to the spot and it looks packed and it looks burdened, leave, go find another spot. Go somewhere else, right? What the whole purpose was to get outdoors and not really be around a whole crowd. So get outside, but be respectful. If you if you see trash, pick it up, right? What a great gesture! I've never seen over the last year the amount of illegal dumping that's going on. You know, that's a sure way of getting Maine's lands posted. Um, we, you know, part of my landowner relations program. You know, Rick and I oversee the Keep Maine Clean program as well. Um, so we utilize um, certain funding and stuff to help relieve uh, some of that illegal dumping. And I'll give you an example. Um, this gentleman in the uh, city of Auburn owns a beautiful 55 acre piece of property. He allows hunting on it. Um, it's right on the outskirts of the city. Somebody this winter decided they were going to go in and uh, dump shingles off, uh, couch and rugs and all that. I assisted him with the cleanup the other day. We removed 10 tons of garbage off of his property. If I wouldn't have done that, he was thinking about posting his land and, and gating it, and not allowing anybody on it, you know, because he was just like, ha, huh. that would have cost him over a thousand dollars to remove that stuff. You know, we got to be cognizant of what the purple paint means, right? This is a great spot to bring that up. All right, you're seeing purple hash marks on trees every 100 feet or so. They're in a vertical manner right there, you know, four feet off the ground. That's not a boundary line, or it could be a boundary line. What that's telling you is that's access by permission only. All right, um, that's a universal, national, recognized, uh, believe it or not, we get people from other states that recognize our purple marks better than our own residents. Um, everybody knew about the silver, you know, two stripes men access, but we got rid of that, what, 10 years ago? 
um, to meet this national standard, this national recognition of access by permission only. And it's one single, uh, what they call Osher purple paint mark. And, uh, you know, does it show up real well? Yeah, if you're looking for purple paint marks, uh, don't take for granted that the land you, or the land that you utilized last year hasn't changed hands to a different landowner, right? Um, you know, I've had a bunch of hunters call me out. Well, it's not fair that the landowner didn't put their name and their phone number on it. Well, first off, that's, uh, it seems to be a little of entitlement to the hunter or the person wanting, or the fisherman or the hiker wanting to uh, have the landowner. You know what, it's not their responsibility. They know they own the land. You, you can go to the local town. You can figure out, um, you know, there's enough apps out there now that allow you to know where the property boundaries are or who owns that piece of property. Uh, but you know what? Or you could do it the old school way and just go to the local town and pull the property tax maps. Guess what? Most of those property tax maps are online nowadays anyway. So with a little bit of research placed upon the person that wants to recreate on it, right? I mean, that's where it comes down to. You want to recreate on it? It's your burden. It's not the person that owns it. So... Um, go to the local town, do a little bit of Googling. Um, it's not that hard to find people, especially nowadays um, with computers and usually somebody knows someone. So uh, do your own, do your research. Yeah, I think maybe asking a neighbor, leaving a note, if you don't feel comfortable going and knocking on their door, even just going into the town office. A lot of main towns are small communities. They might have an idea of who you're looking for. <laughs> I'm fairly certain they will. <laughs> and, uh, you know, also uh, I'll give, I, I did this on our, in a presentation uh, just a couple nights ago. OnX is a great app. It's improving all the time in Maine. Uh, it's a wonderful way to get an idea of who owns the land and the property boundaries. I wouldn't rely on it 100%, but definitely give you some good planning tips for right. if you're thinking about it. Here's where maybe I should start. Right. Absolutely. We utilize that very app ourselves. They're, they're very good to us as a company. We uh, remove that for all the wounds. But again, it's not always 100% accurate. You're going to want to follow up on, uh, you know, um, seeing the physical documentation from the town. Really, it comes down to your local government um, in the area that you're recreating in. And uh, you might be surprised. Um, I've hunted on some properties where I've had the landowner go, you know what? You're the first person that's ever in. And uh, they didn't know I was, so I wasn't asking as the game warden, right? I was asking as, as a regular hunter or, um, you know, the area where I fish. I've fished it since I was a, a little kid. It's a little brook. Uh, one side of it's all posted. That brook has so many memories for me that I, I went and I tracked down the person that owns that piece and explained to them, um, not only did I tell my memories and what I used to do there and what I catch there, they had no idea that they had brook trout in that little brook. So I shared some of my memories and said, Hey, I'll go catch you some and share it with you. And they were like, no, no, no. We just didn't know we had them. And, uh, it, it, it they said, yeah, you can use it anytime you want. Just don't block the driveway. Okay. You know, perfect. That's all they wanted to tell me. Just don't block the driveway. They've had fishermen go down in there and block their driveway. That's why they posted the property. It was that simple. So um, no one likes to see posted signs, but you know what? It gives the landowner control back of their property. Um, the access part permission only signs. That's what it does. You got to remember, they just might have had a bad experience, want to gain a little bit of control of their property and know who's on it and give you some rules. And uh, you know what? That's the least we can do. Great, thank you. And we did have a question come in that I, I feel is appropriate for where we're at in our conversation. How can we facilitate access to land, but also allow privacy for landowners and explain our access? So what are some, some if somebody is, is looking to kind of facilitate access, they want maybe to keep their land open, they're thinking about closing it, or if a hunter wants to be, or land user just wants to be respectful of the land owner, uh, how can, how can, that's a, a tricky balance, I think, for some people. 
Yeah, there's quite a tricky balance there. And I'll, I'll give you, a, just give you an example, right? Um, we were dealing with it down towards the uh, Durham Way. Um, there's a bunch of mountain biking uh, trails um, that come out of our state park down there. Um, they were linking on to uh, snowmobile trail systems. All right. Well, the landowner only gave permission for snowmobile use, right? When he started seeing mountain bikers riding out through his field and then coming up past his house and then riding down the road, he's like, whoa, 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 I don't, I didn't get permission for, well, no, it's a snowmobile trail. No, people have to understand that uh, an ATV trail, a snowmobile trail does not give you public access, all right? That's a trail specific for use. That's a trail that the landowner said, yes, I will authorize you or allow you to use that snowmobile trail. That's what it's for, snowmobile. Doesn't mean that it's open to the public, doesn't mean that you can just go on it um, because it's a snowmobile trail or an ATV trail. So first and foremost, you got to know the rules. Even if you're a dog walker, hiker, or mountain biker, just because you're not hunting, fishing, or snowmobiling, or ATVing, or recreating in the stuff that we oversee as a department doesn't mean that you can just go do what you want. So first and foremost, you need to recognize the fact that uh, somebody owns that property. It's funny, I've dealt with some folks uh, that have come up and very nice folks. Uh, they were just uh, oblivious to the fact that somebody could own that much property. That was what I got for, I, I didn't think anybody could own this much property. It, no, they, you, you, you can. And, and that guy kind of set me back a little bit because I'm like, wow, where would you get that, that thought, right? I, I guess depending on your environment or where you're from or you're not used to where we're at, yeah, I guess if you're living on a, in a little, you know, less than quarter acre piece and yeah, somebody can own. They can own. I mean, we have people that own townships. I mean, townships. So, um, and that's a single person, that's not a company. So it, it's one of those things that we just need to be cognizant of uh, where we're at. Uh, landowner wise, you know, we're always um, looking at different uh, avenues, right? Sometimes it's as simple, we, we have some great landowners here in the state that have called out, utilized um, uh, Corporal LaFlem's ideas and my ideas. Sometimes they're like, listen, I want to allow access. I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a non-resident, but I want people to utilize my property. I know of a 1,700 acre piece up in uh, the industry area. These folks bought it as an investment with not the uh, plan of shutting it down, but the plan of allowing recreation on it. It was a really neat idea. They just didn't want the Jeeps in there. So we gated it, we made up a nice sign, provided a parking area, I mean, these people were willing to provide all the stuff to allow people to recreate on their area. And as long as it was in a designated spot and with designated use, essentially all they wanted to do was shut down the, uh, the jeeping and the four by fouring and the mudding. And we did that, provided this beautiful spot for people to hunt, fish. They did a uh, brook trout restoration on a couple of their brooks utilizing uh, some uh, chop and drop techniques that were followed through by their forester in the department here. I gave them some advice on it. So they're looking to enhance this property for us. I mean, what a, what a neat concept. And all they were looking for was some advice on what should I do? I met with them, told them where they should put the parking area, what to do here, how to, you know, um, shut down that access, how to provide a better access over here. It, it was a great project to work on. So if any landowners out there, you're looking for some advice, reach out to uh, Corporal LaFlem and I. Um, you can look up right on our website. I'm sure you'll provide that link and stuff. Um, Rick and I are here to work for Maine's landowners um, and also to uh, be that go-between between the users and the landowner. So that, that's the really neat thing about my job. I, I'm, I'm able to be uh, proactive sometimes and actually help out both, both sides. So we're here to help you. And I know that, um, you know, we, 
there are people in the chat who have very specific questions about very specific issues or they have concerns me about repeat offenders, somebody coming onto their property without permission, even though they've been asked not to or something along those lines, um, someone leaving garbage, you know, just different issues that, that they might encounter. So what, what are some options for them? What are some next steps? All right, first and foremost, if somebody's trespassing on your property and you've already told them, all right, we need to know about it. All right, sometimes it's not just a warden service issue, but your local police department, your sheriff's department, your state police, okay? So not everything just because somebody's outside comes to us, uh, but again, if your sheriff's department, state police, local PD, you're not getting the service you want, or that you still have questions, or you feel that uh, there's a little bit more to it, by all means, call us. If we don't know about it, we can't help you out. We can't give you um, that advice. First and foremost, we need to know about it. And uh, if we don't, I can't, can't help you. Don't let something small fester to the point that you just say, you know what, I'm done. And that's what I found a lot of is, uh, it was just a bunch of small stuff festering year after year after year after year. And then the land just got fed up and just said, I'm done. When you know what, if you would have been able to just vent and maybe when the first incident and we were able to solve it right off because we knew about it and we went and talked to the hunter, the fisherman, the hiker, tracked the person down that offended the landowner. Sometimes it's a miscommunication thing and it was something as simple as, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize, I thought it was here. And we're able to clear that up rather than it just, just kind of causing an issue later down the line. Nothing bothers me more is when a landowner, well, about 20 years ago, wow, that's how much, right? It's personal. When you do something on a landowner, it's personal. Let's recognize that. I don't care if it's on the back 40, it's still personal, it's theirs. Great, thank you, Dave. And, and you kind of touched on it a little bit, but maybe is a good time to talk about some resources and tools that the department or partners have for landowners. Oh, absolutely, right. We, we have a uh, you know program, Outdoor Partners, as part of this. Um, folks can sign up online, right? It's, uh, what, it, what it provides is uh, people to contribute money uh, that comes directly to this program in turn, I'm able to utilize that money to help means the landowners out, whether that be through um, various signage, you know, access by permission only, no illegal dumping, attention, you know, sportsmen, hey, this land is gonna, you know, is in jeopardy of being posted. I mean, we have various, various uh, signs to assist Maine's landowners. Um, it also provides funding for the Keep Maine Clean program, for example, right? That landowner the other day, I cleaned up 10 tons, a little over $1,000 worth of uh, material that it costs to get rid of. It costs the landowner with his assistance, the use of his small little dump truck and his excavator. So he provided the, his little dump truck in his little excavator and I provided the financial relief of getting rid of the stuff. So what did we get in turn? We still have 55 acres to hunt in the uh, city of Auburn, right? So those are those types of things that allows me, we have partnerships uh, with several, uh, like with waste management, BDS tire, where I can get rid of that stuff um, if it's feasible to uh, get it up there. Um, I've got partners with, you know, Kittery Trading Post, LL Bean that provide uh, financial support to us. Uh, it, it The list goes on and on. I have volunteers, right? Um, I think about, uh, Summit Gas reaching out to us uh, just a couple weeks ago, right? That company provides the employee, I think, 10 hours or 20 hours a year to provide volunteer work. They actually have come to our department to say, hey, do you have any projects, any cleanup projects, anything we can work on to help you guys out? So these are all those connections that I have, both Rick and I have, to uh, provide relief to the Maine's landowner. So don't, don't be shy. If we can help you, we will. If not, we'll provide some type of advice. Um, we, we have Joe, our wildlife biologist that assists landowners in that bag. You know, hopefully he can get on someday and, and talk about his program. 
this department is here. This isn't what's really nice. This isn't, uh, you know, big brother wanting to be overbearing. This is actually, it feels good to be part of a program that is out there contributing and wanting to help rather than wanting to oversee. I'm there to take away the problem and to solve your problem, or at least uh, give you some type of relief. And uh, this actually, I don't, I don't believe there's really many other programs in the state that provide that. So I'm, I'm proud to be part of that. And uh, uh, don't hesitate to give us a holler. If we don't know about it, I can't help you. And if I can't help you, I'm gonna tell you that, but we're at least gonna you know, start on a, uh, some type of journey to get you some relief, so. And you mentioned just while we're on the, the subject, there are some questions coming in that I want to get to, but you mentioned Joe Roy, who is our wildlife biologist for beginning with habitat. Can you talk a little bit about that great program? Ah, well, not, uh, I can talk about it on the, like a reader's digest version. Uh, I don't want to, see it. I don't <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot. We'll post the link for it in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, get, beginning with habitat program, you know, the department, uh, I, I'm not sure when we started it, but it's uh, uh, looking to, it, it's just that, right? Um, providing habitat for Maine's uh, endangered and threatened species, but also he's looking at providing habitat. You want songbirds? He can explain to you how to get songbirds, all right? By contributing um, and turning your property into different uh, habitats, right? Leaving a brush pile. He, he, he'll just something as simple instead of, you know, grinding up that brush pile or burning that brush pile, put it in a spot down in the woods where it's out of sight. That provides home for a variety of different animals. In, uh, it, it, and it's simple, right? You, you built it anyway, put it, put it somewhere where it's going to be utilized by Maine's uh, wildlife. So it's a really neat program. Joe is a very dynamic guy. Um, you'd enjoy talking to them. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, we're, we're looking at, right? People want to see, we, we make this investment on our land, not necessarily because we're hunters, fishermen, but we want to be immersed in it. That's what's really unique about Maine. We want to be immersed. We want to be part of nature. So landowners that can afford it have bought this piece of property. It's their investment. It's something that uh, maybe their legacy that they want to be, leave behind to their children, to their grandchildren. And uh, it's one of those things through that beginning with habitat that they can improve their uh, property for and to uh, cause it to attract wildlife rather than uh, deter it. You know, I have some landowners that have mentioned before, oh, I don't want to harvest any trees. Well, Joe can explain to you why it's important to harvest some or what that does provide, right? Young growth. If you're looking to provide, you know, habitat for, you know, grouse or woodcock, well, you're going to want to do certain cuttings or plant certain things. So great, great program. I'm very glad Joe's trying to get it off the ground. It's really in its infancy right now, but he's making leaps and bounds with it. So. Great. Thank you, Dave. So I did want to get to this question in the chat. And we, we, I think we were talking about this before going live. Uh, isn't LD1033, which is um, propose, a proposal to allow Sunday hunting, the perfect opportunity to teach both hunters and hikers the ethical way to gain access? It is a sustainable approach and will improve relations and access. What are your thoughts, Dave, on this? Uh, there's a variety of, so these are those sun, Sunday hunting bills, right? And uh, so I think there's what, three of them, three different variations. Um, you know, I had a landowner uh, last night uh, send me an email. Uh, it's a gentleman I've known. I've hunted on his property in his brother's property uh, since I was a kid. All right. Um, I harvested deer on their property. And then I became the warden for the area. So I, I know this family really well. Um, it really concerned me. He sent me an email saying, hey, I have 700 acres. If this goes through, I am posting it. And uh, you know what, that, that got me thinking, and he's not the first landowner that's reached out and said that. Um, there's certain traditions we have here in Maine. Um, first and foremost, our open access that we have, right? Let's not take that for granted. If this puts that open access up in jeopardy, we really need to rethink that. 
as a landowner myself, right? If that law passes, guess who's going to benefit? Me and my family, right? I own 120 acres in two different towns. I'm going to be a strict beneficiary of it. I'm going to, I'm going to be able to hunt on Sundays. It's not worth it to me. It, 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 it's something that, you know what? Just because I'm going to benefit from it or my family or a friend is going to benefit from it, if it's going to put something else in jeopardy or make some other main landowners that keep their land open to post it, I don't want it. Um, that's my personal opinion as a landowner, as somebody that's relied on recreating on somebody else's land. Um, I know our department uh, opposes it, right? We respect the wishes of Maine's landowners. I know there are some landowners out there that do want to hunt on Sunday, uh, but you know what? We can't be um, so self-centered or selfish that we're willing to give up um, that open access, that open tradition that we have. We don't want this to backfire on us, all right? Um, it's one of those things that, I, you know what? I don't need that day. I mean, it, I, I get it. People are using, no, I only have Saturdays to hunt. I get it. But don't take for granted what we have right now. So I'm willing to forgo the benefit that I would receive in order to um, make my neighbors happy. That's really what it comes down to. So if that makes my neighbors happy, that's just being neighborly. Um, I heard I heard that loud and clear. You know, he, he sent his time last night because he knew this was coming up this morning. He wanted to make sure that I knew his point of view. And you know what? I, I thank you, John, for sending that sending that to me. And I wanted to kind of just share what that, that thought process did to me last night. And, you know, he is a neighbor. You know, there's a, probably a few hundred acres that separate his property from my property. I respect his wishes. And uh, I'm looking at it as, you know what? That benefit to me isn't worth what we would lose on the other side. So looking at it as a uh, be neighborly thing, we do have 94% uh, uh, of Maine privately owned and uh, we shouldn't be putting, every piece of property is important, whether it's a half acre to a bazillion acres, everything is important. And that half acre may have the ITS trail running through it. And if that gets closed down, we just shut down an entire ITS trail system. So let, let, Let's, let's really, really, really think about this before we uh, make such drastic changes in our, uh, we, we always brag about tradition, tradition here in Maine. Let's, let's really rethink this. Great, thank you. I know it's a very complex issue with a lot of emotions on both sides of the discussion and some people who are actually in the middle who are landowners who may benefit just like you described, Dave. So yeah. certainly it's something that, that people really need to think about and thank you, I thank you for, for taking the time to kind of break that down in your thought process. So going back earlier in the chat, there was a question, any help for bridges on my property? There's a brook that runs through it and I can't access part of my land. So are there any resources for landowners when it comes to infrastructure on their property? Uh, you know what? Um, that's where Joe's program can help them out. Um, believe it or not, there is uh, some federal programs out there. Um, it used to be called the WIP program, Wildlife Habitat Improvement Program. I don't know if that still exists. Um, Joe would definitely be one of those individuals um, that you're gonna wanna reach out to because he's uh, that's what he does. He, he knows what type of programs are available to uh, the landowners um, and uh, he'd be able to really help you out with that. I'm not familiar with it. Um, I am familiar with certain parts of that WIP program when it was uh in place and they did provide fundings uh for roads and access so um i'm not aware if the feds are still providing that i think they are i think it's just under a different different acronym uh but i would reach out to uh, uh usda in uh, situations like that so Great, thank you. And then this is another question. It's a little bit, uh, another, another tricky one maybe. And I know that you were very uh, heavily involved in the ATV task force, which I think happened last year. Was it That's, like, it wasn't that long ago, but yes, definitely it was. And um, so someone asked, do you expect more restrictions on ATV size or weight? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's coming. Uh, matter of fact, I was just talking with our deputy uh, Commissioner about uh, certain aspects of a bill that's going to be going forward in front of the IFMW committee. 
um, they, I believe, just had it this uh, this past Wednesday. So that that's in the works. Um, in simple terms, it's going to be um, essentially it's going to be illegal to register an ATV um, 65 inches or greater in more than 2,000 pounds. So if you're out there looking to buy a new ATV, make sure you're buying an ATV under that 65 inch mark and uh, weighing less than 2,000 pounds, all right? And here's the reason for it. Um, that's not too much to ask, right? Is our infrastructure out there right now, a lot of it isn't, isn't set up for what the industry keeps pushing. Uh, we saw it with snowmobiles, you know, the industry, it just keeps going, right? I mean, it started out with little, uh, you know, 10 horsepower snowmobiles. I mean, we're up to 1,200, 1,500 cc snowmobiles now. Um, it's a way to just protect Maine's landscape, right? Do you really need a vehicle that is larger than most trucks or cars that are on the road now to go out and recreate on somebody else's property. So what these new bills are gonna establish, it's gonna provide uh, funding, all right? Um, trying to catch up on the funding of equal value that snowmobile season gets, right? Right here, we're gonna be able to put that funding directly into the ground. Uh, we're gonna be able to put that um, essentially boots on the ground in establish a better trail system for machines that uh, they cause wear and tear, right? So we want to be able to provide the best service to Maine's landowners, maintain our trails. Not only will it benefit the landowner, but it's going to benefit everybody due to safety. Um, it's going to benefit the state because our landowners are going to still allow the trail system. So this was something, I mean, we had a variety of people on that task force. And these were things that, I mean, that lasted for months. And a lot of time was spent there, a lot of thought process. And this is what come out of it. And it's good for Maine's landowners. It's good for Maine's ATVs. And uh, I think it's a way to continue the growth of what we're seeing. I think it's something that's gonna uh, uh, provide relief to Maine's landowners. I think it's gonna provide access to Maine's ATVers. And uh, this is a good thing. This isn't, there's nothing negative about what this uh, bill is trying to provide. Thank you, Dave. So a, a good question that came in, why does the department promote access by permission only signs for landowners rather than no trespassing signs? Um, I think it's right there in the, right there in the verbiage, right? Um, that no trespassing sign is it's just that. It's like in your face, whoa. I don't know if I want to go and knock on the door. Um, access by permission kind of opens that door for you. It, it's it's there. It's hey, come talk to me. I mean that that that's really. I think it boils down to be that simple. Um, that no trespassing is. Wow. Okay. That 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 really states you know what it means. No trespassing. So really, we. Uh, that access by permission only sign was created to give the landowners back control. And, and that's that first and foremost, that's what it was created for. Um, the landowner doesn't want to shut their property down. They just want to know who's on it and, and or control the number of people that are on it, right? People think, oh, wow, you own that much property? Whoa, hey, listen, 120 acres isn't a lot of property, all right? That doesn't fit 20 to 30 hunters on it. You know what? Realistically, you can fit probably 10. It allows a landowner to control their property. And guess what? Puts the burden back onto the, onto the user. And, and that's, that's really what we need to, if it's not yours, you should, be, should have the burden to you know, uh, figure out who owns it. Great, thank you, Dave. So how far apart should these signs be? Somebody in the chat asked that question. Um, Title 17A, uh, section 402, um, talks about uh, the four different ways of uh, posting your property, all right? I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna pull it up here so I can read. You got Title 12 right there. 
Uh, that's 17A, which is under criminal law. All right. <laughs> so there's a uh, there's a variety of um, different laws out there. So you have a civil trespass law, right, which is only under um, Title 12. Um, then you have a criminal trespass law, which un which is under Title 17A, which is main main criminal statutes. So, and it's designated throughout main criminal uh, statutes on how you can apply posting of property in order for a conviction to happen. So let me uh, pull that out because I can't quite quote everything off the top of my head. And I wanna make sure that everybody out there um, gets the proper verbiage. So, um, Again, that was Title 17A, Section 402, and under, oh, number four, subsection four, it starts listing out the paint markings, a sign, all right, this is how simple it can be, um, signs must indicate that access is prohibited or that access is prohibited without permission of the landowner or the landowner's agent or that access for a particular purpose is prohibited. All right, so that's that mumble jumble of law. Essentially that says the sign has to tell you what they don't want on their property. All right, that could be, you, we, we've all seen it on our ATV trails. ATVs are allowed, but they don't want dirt bikes, i.e. motorcycles, right? So that means if you're on there with a motorcycle or a dirt bike, which is the same thing, there's no difference. It's a two wheeled motorcycle. You can't be there. They just prohibited the activity. Don't go there. You're now trespassing and you can be summons for such, especially if the sign is up, all right? So the other one is the paint markings. They have to be three feet from the ground and five feet. So three to five feet from the ground and no more than a hundred feet apart. They have to be, what is it, one by eight inches in a vertical manner on a tree, on a rock, stuff like that. So three to five feet off the ground, one, to, one inch wide, eight inches long, so that they're visible along the landscape. Um, signs, 100 feet. So if you have access by permission only signs, they have to be 100 feet or no trespassing signs or the posted paper signs, no more than 100 feet apart, okay? Um, or say you only want to essentially protect your road, right? You own a back piece of property or people are utilizing this road or going through this gate, you only have to place a sign right there. I don't want you going through here. So a sign placed in a manner likely to come to the uh, attention of the intruder, all right? So that'd be like posting a sign up right next to your door so that somebody sees it on your house, all right? So that's what that means. So those are, or you can do it verbally or in writing. You know somebody, you don't want them on your property, don't come on my property. You wanna really make it official, put it in a certified letter and send it to them. So those are the manners in which you can uh, control your property. Uh, those manners need to, in order for me to uh, um, summon somebody or prosecute them in the court of law, that is the burden that is placed upon the landowner for their own. You have to follow those, uh, that criteria of law. If that criteria of law is followed, I can summon a person and get them into the court system. Great, thank you for that. So I have time for maybe two more questions because there's one that I, I definitely want to ask and one that I think would be fun to ask. So the first one is if landowners or land users have concerns or thoughts that they obviously we posted Rick and your contact information and the Outdoor Partners Program link in the chat. So that's a good way for them to talk to you maybe personally. But let's say that they want to talk about that in a more public venue or have that kind of discussion in more of a group format. Is there an opportunity for them to do that? Um, as far as, we, Rick and I attend a lot of uh, speaking engagements throughout the year. Um, I'm more than willing and I know uh, 
Uh, Corporal Laflemme is more than willing to meet with any group, any people, any time. Um, it's important to get this message out. So uh, if you just want to have a conversation, feel free to email me, give me your contact info. Uh, I love talking to people. If you have more of a group, whether it be a land trust, whether it be a uh, community organization within a housing development, uh, those are all types of things that, uh, I, yeah, I, I, it doesn't, it does not really matter to us. If somebody's willing to listen to me talk, I'm more than willing to help them out. So um, it's something that really is, uh, means a lot to me. So if I can get that message out and keep uh, um, benefiting what we have here in the state of Maine, then uh, I'm more than willing to go wherever I need to, to talk to whatever groups I want to. Great, thank you. And we are right at the hour. So I do wanna ask one question that came in right at the beginning and it's from someone who I know has been attending a lot of these presentations real in Maine. Out of all the outdoor activities that you enjoy, what is your favorite? What's mine? See, we can talk forever. This, let's go for another hour, Katie. Oh, no. <laughs> I got other things I have to do today. Okay, all right, I, I'd go for another. I mean, I could fill up pretty much the whole day if people wanna listen. Uh, you know, one of my favorite activities uh, really just involves, I, I don't really care. I, I really just want to be outdoors 99.9% .9 of the time. That's why I do this job. This job has allowed me to uh, uh, professionally be outdoors, but also uh, on my days off, I, I do a lot of hunting. I do a lot of fishing. Um, my best memories come with my, with my daughter, taking my daughter, um, and just showing her and a little bit of my passion. And it started when she was just a, just a little peanut all the way up now, you know? Um, yeah, just just trying to get her to appreciate what, what, what I guess it, that's just part of me. So um, I don't really, have, I guess, have a, a soul favorite. It's everything. It, it's really everything. It, it's, it's who I am being, being part of this department and uh, being part of the outdoors and yeah, it, it's just my way of contributing back. I, I hold it uh, near and dear to my to myself, so. Great, thank you. What a, a good note to end the conversation on. We're very lucky to live in this this great state that affords us so many opportunities to go outside and, and enjoy nature in a variety of different ways, whatever your interest levels are. So yeah. I do want, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just, you know, I just want to reiterate to everybody, hey, if, uh, please check out the, you know, Outdoor Partners program. If you can contribute, become a member, um, it goes right back into this program and goes right back into the ground. Um, just, you know, check, please check out all the things we do for Maine's landowners and Maine's land users. So we're here for you. Um, don't, don't think you're bothering us. And uh, that's all. That's really what I don't ever think you're bothering us because you're not. Thank you, Dave. I, I do see some more questions coming in and unfortunately we just, we're just at the hour and we, we won't have time to continue. At least I don't I know Dave wants to go another hour. I have other stuff I have to do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. And I wanna thank Dave for, for joining me and, and maybe we'll have Dave back on to, to join us for another coffee chat, maybe in the future if he enjoys this. <laughs> oh, please do, let's do it. <laughs> And I want to remind everybody that if you've been following along, we've been doing a spring presentation series um, and it's continuing on April 28th with another presentation about Maine's moose. And that's at 7 p.m. And if you are watching on YouTube right now, which you are, you can subscribe to our channel and it will give you alerts for all of those videos when they do come up. And you can also visit emmyfishwildlife.com if you want to stay up to date with different presentations or events, workshops, other things like that that we are offering. So thank, thank you again, everyone, for joining us at home. And, and thank you so much, Dave. Thank you.